Uh, Dr. Saadi brings to our group something that we have never had at Baylor, and he's only been here uh, for a couple of years already, but he's made a huge difference. Uh, he has taught in a great many other places, but his focus is in the languages of Arabic, Syriac, and Aramaic. Uh, and we haven't had his heft in this area, so when he comes to us as somebody that not only does, does work in those languages, but, but also does work in the manuscripts, uh, of that tradition, the Eastern Christian tradition. Uh, this is a tremendous gift to us all at Baylor University, and I hope that you'll all appreciate that. He has an enormous number of degrees. I think I counted eight <laughs> university degrees. <laughs> it's intimidating, but he actually has a, a degree also uh, from a seminary at the very beginning of things back in the 70s, St. Ephraim's Seminary in, uh, in Syria, in Damascus. Uh, he uh, studied uh, and did a BA in engineering, of all things, at the University of Aleppo. Uh, then he did another undergraduate degree in business management <laughs> at the University of Damascus. And by this time, I'm sure everybody that knew him was wondering what was going to become of this very bewildered man. <laughs> but, but then he went on to do some more interesting things at the graduate level. And <clears throat> amongst his graduate degrees are three degrees in theology, church history, and New Testament studies at the master's level. Uh, from the uh, Lutheran Theological Seminary in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, and uh, added to that, in turn, uh, is a PhD. His PhD is in New Testament and Syriac, also from the Lutheran Theological Seminary in Chicago. He's, he has lectured broadly <coughs> uh, on topics having to do uh, with the Syriac tradition. Uh, he's lectured in Australia, in Sweden, uh, he's been a, a, an important consultant for the monastic library at Collegeville, Minnesota. Uh, he is a research as, uh, associate of the Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago. Uh, and his most recent publications are of broad interest to people who aren't medievalists who, who are, or who are not manuscript scholars, but just care about the translation of scriptures into various languages. So he is the translator of the modern Arabic Bible a modern Aramaic Bible for a specific region uh, in, in, in uh, Aramaic sp uh, speech in the Middle East. He's done articles on uh, <coughs> interfaith dialogue, we might call it now, in, in early Christian-Muslim relations going back to the ninth century. And, and for me, one of the things that really makes him a kind of hero for us is that he had the foresight to go in to places like Holmes and Mosul uh, Three, or three and a half years ago, and, and, and perceiving that, that the libraries there, the monastic libraries, the great treasure troves of Christian manuscript tradition were imperiled by political events unfolding in the Middle East. Persuaded um, otherwise normally reluctant people to let him digitize a great number of manuscripts. We would not have, after the ISIS invasion of Holmes and Mosul, and the destruction of so much, including the manuscripts in those libraries, we would not have many priceless Christian manuscripts going back to the ninth century. It's about one of those manuscripts that he wishes to speak today. Dr. Saadi, dear brother, good colleague, we are looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. My colleagues, my brothers and sisters, in fact, what I would like to say is nothing new in the sense and in the language and in the terminology of people from the Middle East. Often in the Middle East we say anything after the fourth century, after the seventh century is just recent one. Unfortunately, to our topic today, this is true. And as I was a month ago or so, I was preparing to speak about this topic. I was wondering how to put the context, to set the context for, from within which Moshe Barkefo, our exegetes, wrote his commentary the political context, social context, but then unfortunately, few days ago, everybody realized, read, 
Even so, and watch that kind of context. By the very fact of brutal facts of ISIS coming to those villages and burning, killing, burning, kidnapping, not only the people, but as they said, they are uprooting every reason for the existence of their opon opponents. The English word for uprooting is probably not so much ex expressive as probably, I wish if it was cutrooting, it would have been more expressive. That is the context, really, what happened <coughs> in the ninth century for these particular authors whose name, it happened, his name was Moshe Bar Kefa, that is Moses Bar is the son of Cephas, that is Peter, sons of Peter. Of course, again, what ISIS is doing is not just kind of directly or this ISIS directed its, its efforts or it set a target as a Christian to persecute. No. For ISIS, as ISIS claim, or those most of the other extremists claim, they are presenting the true faith of Islam, the pure faith, and they, for them, they think they are just exercising what they should, what their faith is telling them. Of course, not only the Christian will not agree with them, of course, that's obvious, but the vast majority, the majority of Muslims either, also, they disagree with them. And in fact, they are, primarily, they are their victims. And the Christians, they are just part of this equation. If for them, or for those extremists, that other part of Islam or Muslims people are not good enough Islams, therefore by far the other, the non-Muslims are not good, enough, not good enough Muslims. Now in the second half of the ninth century, the Syria Christian communities were shaken by the radical shift of the social and religious events of the Abbasid Empire by the 10th Caliph Al-Mutawakkil. And the continuation of these policies through his successors, now as these new policies were implemented, Islamic authorities were severely oppressed. The Mu'tazilite, Mu'tazilite was a sect or a school uh, of Islam or Islamic school. And with the Mu'tazilite, that was their primary opponents, comes the Christians and other religious minorities of that time. Among oh, can I cut my I says my glasses, please? <laughs> I sorry to interrupt. And apparently I've lost my glasses here. <coughs> I look hard to see, but sorry for that. <laughs> wow. I believe I'm that old now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, much better. Along with many Christians, Moshe Bar Kefa suffered under the new policies which severely harassed the Christian communities economically, socially, physically, psychologically, and religiously. The pessimistic outlook of Christian at this time was clearly reflected by the contemporary East Syriac apologist, Yohanna ibn Masawi. Yohanna cried, nowadays, 
Christ himself will become Muslim under the pressure of Al-Mutawakkil. Al-Mutawakkil's rules, which he ascribed to Umar, that is the second caliphs, and which became known as the Pact of Umar, or the Umar conditions, greatly restricted the freedom of Christians. Among other restrictions, the pact forbade Christians from criticizing Islam on the pain of death. Furthermore, Al-Mutawakkil imposes psychological pressure on both lay and learned Christians <coughs> by recruiting Muslim writers to humiliate the Christians, especially in the eyes of populace and to challenge Christian teachings. As a result of this policy, many priests, bishops, theologians were imprisoned and the other <coughs> suffered silently. In such strange circumstances, the Christian community with no capacity to respond to these policies endured their fate. But they greatly, but they dealt internally with their religious differences in warm and harmonious ways. The Muslims of always viewed the differences among Christians as an obvious sign of the incredibility of the Christian faith. As they always invoke their scriptures saying, saying in the name of God, of course, we caused among them, among the Christians, animosity and hatred until the day of resurrection." End quote. Mostly all Muslim debaters highlighted this topic in their refutation of the Christian faith. Second hottest topic of controversy posed against Christians was the Christian doctrinal affair or uh, uh, beliefs, including the divinity of, Christ, uh, divinity of Jesus, the Trinity, the incarnation, the integrity of the Bible, the free will, and the paradise. Now, by way of instructing his community, Moshe Barkefa writes and elaborates on these two topics and their branches. As far as the contents of the Gospel of Luke allow, but only to conclude that Christians are in agreement with all points that define the Christian faith. At the same time, he opportunely uses these same topics to clearly, to clearly, and to clarify the differences between Christians and Muslims. But unlike the Muslims, who aim to undermine the Christian faith and gain converts, the restricted Moshe Barkefa aims to protect this, his Christian community by way of instructing them with biblical responses to Muslims' objections. It was in the context of enduring the Islamification policy of Al-Mutawakkil and in the context of open receptive relations, relationships among Christians of different traditions that Moshe Bar Kefa, the Syriac Orthodox Bishop, ministers to his community and wrote his commentary on the Gospel of Luke. In a nonpartisan or say ecumenical theological approach, especially the Christology with apologetic tendency responding to Muslims. Now his writing strategy and the genre that he followed. Moshe Barkefa's writing strategy is characterized by his even-handed treatment of the theology of various Syriac traditions, namely the East Syriac, that is the Nestorians, the Malachite or Chalcedonian they are known, the Syriac Maronites, and 
the West Syriac that's known also as the Jacobites. Throughout his commentary, Barkefa avoids the controversial watch words of Christology, such as one or two natures, <laughs> one or two hypotheses, one or two wills, etc. In fact, on many topics, Moshe Barkefa resorts to the early Syriac theological theme, namely the divinity of the, or the divine mystery of God, or again, to the in incomprehensibility of the word of God. In order to foster harmony among the diverse Christians, under the theme of the divine mystery, he discusses the various and diverse views among Christians' tradition, even within the same tradition, but only to conclude that these differences point out to the common belief in the Godhead of Christ, the Word of God. By following this strategy, Moshe Barkefa aims to present an easy, accessible, acceptable, uniform Christian teaching for the instruction of the Christian communities in the face of the Islamification policies. <coughs> Additionally, Moshe Barkefa employs the term heretics, ostensibly to refer to the ancient non-canonical Christian teaching, which had mostly ceased to exist by his time. Yet surreptitiously, he refers to Muslims. In fact, Islam was clearly viewed as heresy by Christian communities over a century before the time of Moshe Barkefa. Moreover, John, more directly or explicitly, John of Damascus, that's in mid ninth century, eighth uh, century, wrote about the heresy of the Ishmaelite, by which he mean the Muslims. In effect, by the ninth century, the Christian apologist had perceived Muslims' belief akin as a kind to to that of the Jews or Judo-Christian heresies influenced by Marcionites, Manichaeans, Arians, and some other pagan beliefs. By implementing this strategy, Moshe Barkefa aims at achieving two goals. First, to respond to the Muslim challenge without risking any dangerous consequences. Second, he aims to instruct and assure his faithful community of its belief and strengthen its own sense of religious credibility. The style of Moshe Barkefas on the commentary was dialectical. In this dialectical style, he furthers the literary tradition of the formal genre of discourse in the Syriac schools. Moshe Barkefa often starts his explanation by saying, they say, we ask, they answer, let us ask, and finally say, and we say, or we answer. We make our final answer. Moshe Barkefa converse with his readers by reviewing the other viewpoints, then interpreting the verse. Such a literary genre enables Moshe Barkefa to be inclusive in his argument, which are ultimately apologetic in nature. Now to his topic. Moshe Barkefa's apologetic theme runs throughout his commentary, verse after verse, and episode after another, explaining, expounding, and declaring Christ as the Lord and God. His apologetic intention is clearly directed to Muslims' objections when he addresses it as to heretics. 
or when he deals with obvious subject like the paradise. At the same time, Moshe Bar Kefa elaborate on all kinds of differences among Christians' interpretations as far as the contents of the gospel allow, but only to conclude that Christians are in agreement in all points that define the Christian faith. The topic of the word of God is God. Invoking Quranic references to Jesus as, quote, God's word and spirit from him, as stated in the Quran. Moshe Bar Kefa comments on Luke chapter 1, 2, which reads, those who were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. Moshe Bar Kefa explains that the disciples experienced and ministered the word of God, and not merely a man, as the heretics claim. Moshe Bar Kefa is right, unquote, the gospel says that the apostles saw and ministered the word of God, not merely a human being, as the wicked, one, <coughs> the wicked ones say. Moshe Bar Kefa continually reaffirms that truly the word God was seen in flesh. In these comments, Moshe Bar Kefa clearly underscores the central Christian theme of the divinity of Jesus. He repeatedly makes use of the Quranic terms, the word of God, Kalimatullah, as a title for Christ, leveraging his argument from Muslim scripture, that's the Quran, despite the fact that the Muslims stop short admitting that this word of God is divine. Now concerning the controversial topic of the paradise, Moshe Bar Kefa contra contrasts the spiritual concept of Christian's paradise with the earthly concept of the Muslim paradise. In Luke 1, again, still in the chapter 1, Luke 1, 17, which reads, and to prepare for the Lord a perfect people. Moshe Bar Kefa identifies the perfect people with the Christians because they are concerned with hope for heavenly rewards and not hoping for a land that flows with milk and honey. Although neither the verse nor the context refer directly to paradise, Moshe Bar Kefas elaborate on the verse to covertly address this topic in a clear reference to Muslims. The doctrine of Jesus and God are identical. Commenting on Luke 1, 16, the annunciation of the angel Gabriel to Zechariah that his son, and the quote, will turn the Israelites to the Lord their God. Bar Kefa identifies God with Christ. Moshe Bar Kefa responded to the objections of the heretics who claim that according to the angel, God will turn the people to their God and not to Christ. Moshe Bar Kefa, on the other hand, argues that the word Christ, Jesus Christ, did not appear here because it was hidden from the angel and it was kept secret to be announced at the proper time. While Moshe Bar Kefa's opponents separate God and Christ, he asserts that the Lord their God refers only to Jesus Christ. Again, in Luke 2, 11, which reads, Behold, a Savior is born for you, who is the Lord, the Messiah. Moshe Bar Kefa demonstrates the identity of Jesus Christ as the Lord God from the angel's declaration. Then he elaborates saying that Christ is with the Father in eternity, where there is no time or space. This human birth, however, is for us 
and for our salvation and not for the sake of edification of Christ. Thus Moshe Bar Kepha stresses the identification of Jesus Christ with the Lord God and rejects any reason to doubt Jesus' divinity and <coughs> immortality, an issue frequently raised and rejected by Muslims. Intentional denial or unintentional denial of Jesus as Christ and as Lord. Commenting on John, on Luke 2, again, second chapter of Luke, concerning the prophecy of Simon the Elder and a sword will pierce through your soul and the deeper thought of many would be revealed. Moshe bar -Kefa distinguishes between those who disbelieve in him because of their weakness as opposed to those because of their wickedness. While he clearly refers to the priests and the teachers of the Jews as non-believers because of their bad ill, bad will, he surreptitiously referred to Muslims as the heretics, as he said, and I quote, but those deny him because of their ill will as the priests and the teachers of those, In those he means the Jews. And as this, the heretics of today. The last day, the eschaton, Moshe bar -Kefa opportunely uses the eschatological passages in Luke, that's chapter 17 and 18, also to, refer, to reflect on the turbulent circumstances of his days. In so doing, he intend to comfort and raise his people's hopes on one hand and to respond to the mockery of Christians by Muslims who identify their political domain with their religious truth, truth. On the other hand, the Muslims often confronted Christians saying, if God has saved you, why do you endure such misery? Then bringing from Luke saying, quote, a time will come when you desire to see a day from the days of the Lord, of the, of the Son of Man, but you will not see. Moshe bar -Kefa depicts the turbulent times of the Christians, the Christian have to endure, but he reaffirmed, he affirmed them that such turbulence is for good purpose. He writes, one may wonder if Christ wants to intimi intimidate and terrify his followers. We say, on the contrary, Christ wants us to become courageous, ready, and prepared for the time of afflictions. For God's sake, Christ also wants us to be patient and steadfast. Reflecting on the loose of many Christians to Islam, Moshe bar -Kefa comments on Luke, again the same theme of Luke chapter 18, that reads, when the Son of Man comes, will he see faith on earth? Moshe bar -Kefa explains that Christ has predicted that before the, his second coming, many people would go astray. Moshe bar -Kefa writes, Christ has defined faith as, and here I quote, believe in God and in me. He also informs us about the turbulent words, saying, in my second coming, fewer will be found who believed in God, because their love will be dwindled for many reasons. Thus, they shift from faith to no faith. 
Also fewer will be found who trust the rewards which I have promised to the religious ones, to the righteous ones, end quote. He had another subject of the divinity of Christ, of the word of God, from birth. Moshe Barkefa confirms the main mainstream theolo Christology among Christians that conception of the word of God came from heaven and not from earth. And therefore, he is God, not merely a man, as the heretics claim. Commenting on Luke 1, 31, For behold, you will receive conception and will bear a son. Moshe Barkefa elucidates his apologetic theme in both directions, first displaying the common belief of all Christians that the son of the, the son who was born in Mary is God the Word in mysterious way beyond human comprehension <coughs> despite their various interpretations. Second, in sharp contrast with Muslims who admit that Jesus was born was not born or he is not of human seed, but they feel but they all denounce Jesus' divinity. Moshe Barkefa questions his reader or listener saying, how and whom did Mary conceive, God or man? And if they say he is a man, it's not true because the conception did not happen, did not result from, did not result or come from Joseph or from another man, just like as the Muslims admit. Therefore, Mary conceived God, the word. How? Moshe Barkefa asks. In response, Moshe Barkefa explains that it all happened in a way that we human cannot speak, comprehend, or explains his birth in flesh. Commenting on, Moshe, commenting on Luke 135, which reads, And the angel said, Behold, the Holy Spirit will come, and the power of the highest will descend upon you. Moshe Barkefa resorts to the, divinity, to the divine mystery concerning how the conception occurred. Moshe Barkefa recalls many various interpretations given by Christians but all signifies to the reality that the conception happened just as was announced by Gabriel, the angel. Since the whole conception is of the divine economy, neither human nor angel can comprehend how. He writes, the angels did not answer how Mary will conceive because this conception is beyond the knowledge of both angels and human beings. For none can comprehend how the power of the highest can be conceived in, in the Virgin, except he, that's Christ, and his Father, and the Holy Spirit. While how the Word of God was conceived is beyond comprehension, Moshe Barkefa explains that the angels, the angel reveal who, who is the one who took flesh and who is the one who made him take flesh. For in a process of all creation, this order was followed. The father commands the creation to be created the Son creates it, and the Holy Spirit guides and perfects it. Likewise here, the Father willed that the Son be created for our salvation, and the Son enacted the incarnation, and the Holy Spirit made the Son take flesh because the Holy Spirit formed the body 
to which the sun is united hypostatically or in person. <coughs> in validating all kind of Christological differences among Christian, Moshe Bar Kefa resorts again to the Syriac theological theme of the incomprehensibility of Godhead. As he comments on Christ being a sign of contention, according to Luke 2, 34. He argues that the differences among Christians are due to the incomprehensibility of God, the world. Again, quote, when a Christian contend concerning him, they all preach his incomprehensibility. That means his divinity. <laughs> Therefore, they all proclaim Christ as God the Word. At the same time, <coughs> refute the counterclaim by Muslims that Christ is merely a man. What defines the Christian faith? Good definition from the ninth century. Concerning, again commenting on eschatological passages, which reads, when the Son of Man will come, will he find faith on earth? Moshe Bar Kefa distinguishes between Christians and non-Christians. And in order to group all Christians as faithful people, he defines faith in two ways. First, believing in one God, three hypostases, the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. That's one. And second, trusting his word and promises. Again, he, he was the word, and word in semantic languages, it's not just a noun or verb, it's synonym to action. Trusting his action, trusting his promises, that is, interact with God's, according to God's words, according to the God's action. There is sense of interaction with God. With such a definition, Moshe Bar Kefa presents the basic Christian faith that is accepted and defended by all various Christian traditions. Additionally, with such basic and incontrovertible principles, <coughs> the Christian communities could stand firm before the challenge of its challengers, the Muslims. And in conclusion, through these citations, it became clear that Moshe Bar Kefa's central theme is the divinity of Jesus in the context of the Islamic challenge in his commentary on Luke. Moshe Bar Kefa fulfills his attempts to instruct all Syriac Christian communities with an inclusive, comprehensible, accessible theology. Moshe Bar Kefa's theological sets sets a precedent for mutual theological, Christological, ecclesiastical understanding among various Christian traditions. At the same time, he communicates with his com he communicates his teaching to the Christian community in response to the Muslims despite the forbidden conditions as he writes surreptitiously and allegorically. In so doing, he achieves his purpose of defending Christianity from aggressive Muslims derision and doctrinal affair, warf warfare. At the same time, edifying and unifying the Christian communities. Thus indeed, Moshe Bar Kefa is an exegete an apologist proper. And thank you. <laughs> Professor Sa'adi, I'm going to take some of your questions and respond. 
thank you very much thank you. for this. Um, uh, <coughs> it's fascinating to hear a uh, Christian in this Syriac tradition that does not want to emphasize the two natures or two hypostases or two wills. It's, it's, and you said that uh, he is unique. Is he the first to do this kind of more, what I'll say, ecumenical within Syriac circles? Is he the first? Yeah. The Syriac, always when they speak in theology, we speak theology or Christology, they never speak in a prose way. Always they say the only way to address theology is poetical style, in poetical style. Because there is no way to circumscribe the divine, only to point out to divine. And even when we point out, they use the word <coughs> symbol or secret, <coughs> mystery. Mystery in Syriac means refer to symbol. That no matter what I say, it is just a matter of symbol pointing to the divine. And even that symbol is a human symbol, it's not divine symbol. So there is no way, no way to express the divine in human language. To the degree, in fact, and here if I will quote Saint Ephraim, he will say, the most productive way to define, not to define, to know God is through meditation mm -hmm. and through divine, he used divine silence. So with Musha Bar Kefo, probably he's one of the earliest father who will speak in prose, in prose, he write in prose and say it very clear. Following his father, following Musha Bar Kefo who was in ninth century, one from, uh, or many fathers, actually many writers from the 10th and 11th century, it became very common theology in that region to speak in terms of more ecumenical way to say more often that everything we speak, we are referring to the same thing, even though we are using different terminology. And this is the different terminology that you are using because we are speaking about divine. And that, that literature is abounds in the Syriac tradition from beginning from Moshe Bar Kefa, he wrote it in this context, but then apparently taking from this source, many writers, in the 10th, 11th, and all the way to the 13th century where there was still really active literary movements, they wrote and, uh, expressing this uh, tendency. I'm more familiar with some Syriac theologians from the 6th or uh, century or 7th century, and um, uh, but predominantly the 6th, and uh, their disagreement on the two nature type issues was just a rabid, very contentious point. One might argue that uh, uh, the Muslim influence uh, was a very mixed blessing to the future of Syriac theology for it to come together the way that it did. Because you it is, can't yeah. see that early on. <clears throat> it looks like it's going to be very divisive for onward. Yeah, as you say, it was, I mean, in many schools were divisive and set boundaries, but from, and even among Christian uh, tradition, in Christian Syriac tradition also, they had to select whether to have to be in the part of one nature or two natures as the history unrolled. However, their own theology, their own writing, they never address this kind as a, as a big issue. Even when they want to defend, for instance, the two nature or one nature, you see their argument is different than what they, their conclusion is. They speak only the mystery of God, that it is incomprehensible. And then they said, finally, therefore, it is useful to say it is two nature, or it's useful to say one nature. But their argument has nothing to do with that. 
other questions? You, you have one. Do we know why Moshe mm -hmm. Bar Kefa choose Luke for do the commentary and not other <coughs> gospels? In fact, this commentary, just Dr. David was referring to, it was until recently was known to be lost forever. And uh, just with the share of luck, we were able to identify and not discover it and identify this one again. It was written about it and all, most of the scholars were saying, unfortunately, his commentary is lost. And we were lucky to see this commentary like 15 years ago. And now there is good edition and soon is going to be printed. And uh, it is the only, only copy that was survived. This copy belonged to the 11th century. He wrote it in the 9th century, obviously, but the copy itself that we have is belonged to the seventh, uh, to 11th century. And why it's lost, obviously, we can answer it now. As we see, ISIS on the TV and the YouTubes, that when they persecute, they have to get everything to uproot or cut root of the community. So no wonder why. Another <laughs> question here, and then, uh, then over here. <laughs> so how, how widespread do you think, uh, do you think this gentleman's uh, writings went, in both, I guess, in terms of number of copies and in that region? How, how widespread do you think it, his teachings were, his commentary? Yeah. At his time, certainly has big effect until the 11th century. Everybody was quoting him from all various traditions. That's why we knew, I mean, we learned that he has this kind of commentaries because they were quoting his commentaries, quoting his, uh, uh, his teaching. That's why it is known. Uh, later on, uh, the situation was, the political situation was extremely, extremely dark. And those books were survived only by the fact I mean, this book or whatever is survived by the fact that there is habits in the monasteries, in the Syriac monasteries, which I was raised in the monasteries since I was 11 years old myself. And literally, one of our work, one of our daily work for everybody is to take the book, the existed book, and rewrite them. And most of our curriculum that we study with it, it was our own handwriting. That was up to my time. <laughs> uh, so anything left, it's easy to reproduce it again and have it again, no matter what. It is very sad, really, how, as uh, Dr. David was referring to many library, many precious library in Mosul, and even among those villages that I know, I know their churches very well, I know their houses very well, the, I, I'm referring to the villages of Khabur in Syria or the last, two, last week just they ISIS were, were invited by ISIS and they burned their uh, churches and their uh, old properties. Uh, we saw those manuscripts in our own hand, on our own eyes. And just after a few weeks, as you see, or after two or three years, everything is gone and gone forever. And this story repeated itself over and over and over again. Almost in every colophon that we read in the manuscript, they would say, we came back to the monastery after our books were burned, and we find this kind of book hidden there and there and there, and now we are rewriting it again. It is common story. Yes. Between two religions? Between the two religions. Um, between um, Islamic religions and Christian religions. Um, Syrians, of course. Do you think that there will be a between those, those two religions? Yeah. Well, there is only one true religion. Well. The word religion itself, the word religion itself, it's a little bit controversial 
how to define what how we define the religion religion in english for instance means something in arabic it means another thing in syriac in aramaic it means third thing in aramaic the religion means tawditho means the grace the thankfulness that need to be thankful for God that give us this way to walk the way <coughs> and interact with the word again word action interaction this is the same verb uh, for the Muslims the name for religion is Deen Deen which comes from judgment to be judge and obviously in English it is religion to be bind to be bound together uh, and legion we know the legion uh, could mean also i mean hosts army uh, so the religion of thankfulness is the best to be thankful to god mm -hmm. any other questions yes sir in trying to reach out to <coughs> communities over and around the different Christological controversies. Is there any reason to suspect that Moshe Barkefa is also trying to reach Byzantine Chalcedonians and suggest a kind of unity with that audience as well? One of the Syriac communities adapted totally the Chalcedonian, I mean the Byzantines believe that is the Malachite. They call them Malachite. Malachite comes from the word Melek, which means king. So it was first a kind of a pejorative term that you belong to the king rather than to the community, then became just a term. So they are part of the community. And part of the community, they are talking to them in exactly with the same tune. And most of their authors, the Syriac Malachite authors, they were writing in the same mentality, with the same idea, with the same way of thinking. So in Christianity, again, uh, we should not uh, restrict it to what's so-called Latin Christianity or Latin theology as opposed to the Greek theology. The third branch of Christianity that uh, was flourished for hundreds of years, of course, still not died, still alive, uh, still produce a lot of literature. Uh, it stands by itself and in support of the oneness of Christian faith. back here and then up here. I'm going to uh, tag along with what he said. Do you suppose Mikhail Barkapa was also speaking, or did you have you noticed in your reading of, and translating of his work that he was speaking to some crypto-Christian Muslims, those that uh, converted over the, between the 7th and 9th century, that may still have Christian leanings as well as the, the religion of the majority? Yeah. Yeah, the issue here is in as a clear way that he addressed this kind, this kind of a group, there is nothing like that. I mean, to be decisive, no, nothing specific to this gray group, that they are not Muslims, they are not Christians. Uh, I don't know if it ever existed that way in any group. Uh, of course, when we speak about Muslims, we don't mean that every Muslim is ISIS or every Muslim supported the Al-Mutawakkil or from that. In fact, Al-Mutawakkil uh, brutally crushed the Mu'tazilite, which was Muslims, uh, sex to speak, or Muslims' uh, school of thought. They used to believe more in philosophical way that uh, anyway in philosophical way uh, that the word of God for instance they, that's the main issue main doctrine for their main, main doctrine that the word of God that is the Quran their Quran should not be viewed as a divine from the moment it was uttered and began to read it became a human since it's a human now the version that we have is a human version, not divine version. Therefore, we need to look at it only on its own context. Whatever it is, it cannot apply to every generation and every time. And therefore, there is area of interpretation and 
elaborations and be creative of that. As opposed to Al Mutawakkil, that's with this one that we uh, that he crushed that movement. Uh, he resort to the traditional way of thinking, and in fact, he has brutally crushed them to the degree that, in fact, he annihilated them over over time. Of course. I think we can take one more question. Yes, sir. Uh, I was wondering, um, did Mashi Barakatha uh, critique the violence of the Islamification? And if so, I'm wondering, uh, how did he do that uh, along with reconciling the violence within Christian scripture and tradition? I mean, you understand what I'm asking? Yeah. Uh, it didn't come to that to have or to... Uh, to address the reform within Islam itself, uh, he spoke about the Christian that were lost to Islam by saying that, well, that was even predicted in the gospel. Uh, but we should trust the, the Lord, which trust his words, his, uh, again, the aim of Mushi Barkefa was not to destroy or to attack the Muslims, rather to protect themselves from the Muslims, from the, this Islamic. Uh, <coughs> and at the same time, going back, he, und he knows, he knows very well that most of those Muslims or normal Muslims in the empire were Christians. In fact, one of his branch of his diocese, that was, they used to call it the Hira in Iraq or the Arabs, Christian, they were uh, Christians before, I mean centuries before Islam, they were Christians. And Mushi Barkefa was their bishop. Once upon a time, like type of ISIS, they went there and they forced them to convert to be Muslims. They said, well, those who speak Aramaic, no problem. I mean, it's special case, but you speak Arabic, and you are Arabs, therefore there is no way except to be Muslims. As a result, of course, with this kind of, uh, of uh, circumstances, the majority became Muslims. In his deep heart, he knows that those became Muslims, but internally, wholeheartedly, they are still Christians. Will you join me in thanking Professor Saadi for a wonderful <laughs>